All right, so section 5.2 is on simple harmonic motion, and it's a whole lot more of definitions. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through them. That way it doesn't take so long to go through all them. And then I'll do the example that's in it with you. So it starts out with um, just Hooke's Law, as we know it from last section. And then this chapter, we want to look at it as an equation of motion. So we actually just write out basic, like Newton's second law of just M, um, MA, so mass times acceleration equals force. And then we get just x dot dot all on its own. And so this is what we end up here. We end up with negative k over mx. And then we're going to define a new variable. Um, of omega to be the square root of k over m. That way, we just get that negative omega squared is going to be equal to, uh, or negative omega squared times x is equal to this x dot dot. And that'll be the same um, if it's a theta on a pendulum. Um, that was also stated in the last section. So it's just another thing the author wants us to keep in mind is that pendulums are harmonic motion. So the first thing we can tell you about this equation is that since it's a second order differential equation, you're gonna get two general solutions in the form of x equals e to the i w or i omega t and x of t equals e to the negative i omega t. I don't know why I switched the order, but I did. Um, so then what you can do, it's called superposition principle, is you add them together to get the whole general solution as one, and you put coefficients on them. Uh, that way, they can match up in whichever which way. So that's kind of it. And then it brings it down. And we're going to turn it into sine and cosine using this property. Um, so the trig properties, I think I have them all just written in red from here on out. Um, so that's pretty simple. I do it a lot. Uh, you just end up getting, uh, you combine them all to get um, what we have right here. And then we're going to define that we're going to make this equal to B1 and all this, including that I right there, is going to be equal to B2. That way it just looks really pretty. And so we're going to solve for B1 and B2. And basically, the premises, is, the premises of that is this uh, equation is going to be basically if we have time zero, then the only thing that survives is going to be this cosine. And this cosine is going to be 1 because the cosine of 0 is 1. So you're left with B1 only. And whatever that is, it's going to be your x naught. So B1 is just your x naught. Um, and then if you take the derivative of this function, this part goes to the sine, and this part goes to a cosine. So B2 times the derivative of what's in here. So omega is going to be all that's left there. Um, and then that's going to be equal to whatever your initial velocity is, so V0. And then you solve for, B, for B2 right there, and you get V0 over W. And so now this is our new equation. And since we don't know those, it doesn't really make it more specific, but it makes it so that as soon as we get a problem, we just know what it is. We don't have to go through that derivation every time. Um, so it, it can also tell us some things. So what the book then has us do is consider two things about this equation. So the first one is we're assuming that it's at rest, and then we're going to apply a force to it. So if we we just boop the object a little bit, it's gonna like swing very small and it's not really gonna change. So the sine function is basically, it's gonna be going right about zero, so the sine function is gonna zero out and we just don't have to care about it. That way we're left with only uh, the cosine part of the x function. And then if we take that same object that's at rest and this time we just yeet it, um, we're only the sine's going to survive. So the cosine 
it'll it'll be like it's going up to uh, pi or negative pi. The cosine will just go away. Um, so we're ending up with just this. So what that basically tells us is that whether we boot it, we boop it or we eat it, uh, both solutions are going to have a periodic oscillation since they're still dependent on cosine and time and sine, which can be defined as like the angular the angular velocity uh, for whatever period we do that. So a whole period of that angular velocity. That means we're going to travel uh, two pi during whatever the product of this is. So in order to find out what our period is, um, we just sort of solve this equation for period. And then this omega, we're going to revert back to uh, its definition. Um, this way, if we have a problem that gives us, us, in, us the variables in terms of mass and the spring constant, we can just find it really quick. So then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take this right here, but sort of as a more general one. We're going to take the V1 and V2 of it, and we're going to convert it into a phase shift. That way we only have to deal with one cosine instead of a cosine plus a sine. And it's going to use this trig property right here. It's in the cover of our textbook, if you have the textbook. Um, if not, it's probably on the online PDF, or you could just Google it. And what we're going to do is we're going to define an A uh, such that it is the Pythagorean theorem component to B1 and B2. And what that is going to mean is that if we do B1 over A, it's going to be equal to the cosine of some angle. And therefore, if we do B2 over A, it's going to be equal to the sine of that same angle. Uh, so that's just a basic definition that we're pulling in. And what we're going to do then is we're kind of, we're going to multiply by A over A. So we're going to multiply by one. And then we're going to distribute the bottom half of that fraction into our parentheses part right here. That way, we get that this part right here. As we have in our definitions up here. So from there, we can just combine them using that trig property up here. And we get A, which we're going to notice is the amplitude, uh, times cosine um, of omega t minus some angle. So this will be like our theta naught, whatever our original angle is. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go all the way back to um, our exponentials, so I'm going to scroll up just so you can see them for a minute. We're going to go to this function right here. And we're, what we're going to try and do is we're going to find only the real solutions to this function. Um, so let's go back down there. And we're, the book introduces new notation here. So z star is going to be the complex conjugate of z, which basically just means that if z is x plus i, y, then z star is going to be x minus i, y. Um, and what we need to know for this part is that x is the real values. So, any, so y, since it's times i, it's not going to produce any real values with us unless we could get it somehow separated from i, which we will not be doing in this problem. But what we're basically going to do, so I rewrote out the problem here, and then we're going to use our definitions of C1 and B1, B2, um, which is, this is just how we defined them up earlier. We're just bringing it down so that you can see it, and you can clearly see that C2 is the complex conjugate of C1. That way, we can write our equation more like this, where you see we replace C2 by complex conjugate of 1. 
And so I'm gonna, we then analyzed it with uh, this Z definition that we had up here. And I'm gonna trace the real values right here. So what's gonna survive since this and this will cancel out is just gonna be 2x. So here you see why I'm using a uh, orange highlighter, but it's gonna we introduce even more new, new notations. So R so R E Z just means the real values of Z, which is X. So then we can see that it's gonna do the same thing to our value over here. So we're gonna get that two times the real values of C1 times E to the I omega t is going to be equal to x. Uh, from there, we're going to sort of replace the real values of c1 with um, a, which is going to be our amplitude, just because it makes it more clean cut and nice. So how we do that is we just take our definition of c1, and we combine it with that definition of a that we had. Um, and we also kind of apply um, the here, Taylor approximation of this up here. So there's a couple steps going on right there, but it's just really simple to put it all in one like that, uh, at least for time purposes. And then what happens here is x of t is then going to be equal to this function. And the cool part of all that is that right here looks exactly like a phase shift up. So that's why we did that long thing, um, just to sort of show that they're very similar. And now if I did this, I end up getting this bad boy up here. So the next thing we're going to do, this is actually the example. So this will be where it gets like something. So what we're doing from here is the example in the book is I have this tub, my lovely, lovely tub. And inside this tub, I have water. It's my beautiful water level. I'm gonna make it kind of flat. And then more inside this tub, I have a bottle. All right, and inside said bottle, I have a small liquid here, that way it's got more of a weight than just a bottle. I'm gonna throw some water here. It's gonna be our water. I'm getting really into the drawing. Okay, so what's gonna happen there is we're gonna kind of look at the depth. So whatever the bottom height is, it's gonna be depth and we're gonna look at the force of, if I push the bottle down, what'll happen. Because um, if I push it down, it'll try to bounce back up with buoyant force. But if you've ever done that, it sort of just goes like this and then eventually gets there. Um, so the first thing we wanna note is that at equilibrium, so that's gonna, at equilibrium, the grab, so the force of gravity, so mg, is gonna be equal to the, density of water times g times whatever the uh, cross-sectional area of the bottom of the bottle is times the uh, equilibrium depth, with depth, which we're gonna call d naught. So that's just gonna be very nice. Um, and it sort of just tells us what these two are and how they relate to each other. From there, now we're gonna say we're applying a force. So it's no longer gonna be that cute and cuddly. It's gonna be a bit rougher around the edges. So whatever force we apply is going to be equal to gravity. And then what's gonna act on it is the buoyant force. So that buoyant force, it's gonna be the mg or the rho g times um, this cross-sectional area. And then the depth this time is going to be d naught. So our original depth of just that equilibrium point plus whatever x we decide to push 
the bottle to. And what's cool about that is when you distribute, you end up with terms of this. And since we have this equation up here, you know that subtracting and or you know that subtracting this from mg is just going to equal zero. So that's what we're going to end up producing right here. So all that's going to be left is this part times x. Everything else is going to zero out. So we have m x dot dot uh, times rho g a times x. So that's a lot nicer, and we're going to get it into that equation of motion. So we're just going to solve for x dot dot, which is going to be rho g a over m times x. Now, as a definition, uh, this was just in the textbook, rho g a over m is just equal to g times the density, or not the density, times the original position. You can get that from, um, I think this equation up here is this original guy right there. So with that in mind, we now know that um, x dot dot is going to be equal to negative g over initial depth times that x. And from there, we can look at this and say, wow, that kind of looks like I could just let um, omega equal the square root of the positive stuff of that. And I'd get a really familiar function where negative omega squared times x equals x dot dot. Um, so that's really big point of this uh, problem right here. And then it has you solve for the period and just sort of use that equation a bit. But I'm just not going to go over that because it, it's just plug and chug from there. Nothing too fancy. So the last thing that happens um, is that we look at energy constraints. So we look at, since we have a position uh, equation, we're going to find the energy from that. So in order to do that, all we really need to know is our position equation. And we're going to use the phase shift one. And then we are going to take its derivative. And so that's what that is right there. Now, we're going to find the potential energy, which is going to be that spring potential that we got um, in the first section, so section 5.1. So it's going to be 1 half kx squared. And then we're going to use our x value, and we're going to get this bad boy right here. I'm not going to read it out to you, because that's going to take too long. And then our kinetic energy is going to be 1 half mx dot squared. It's hard to see that dot, but it is, it is there. I'll try to make it bigger. There. Um, so we're going to take our derivative function here and plug that in for x dot. And we're going to end up with this here. And then we're going to use the definition of omega, which is the square root of k over m. And what that is going to do is since it's squared, it's going to take the square root array and we're going to get right here. We're going to end up with m times k over m, so one of the m's will cancel, which is a good thing because then when we look at this total energy, which is going to be uh, the kinetic energy plus the potential, we get this function right here, and when we factor out one half k times a squared from all the terms, we get left with a cosine squared plus a how much plus b squared squared. And that'll leave us with just one half k times a squared is going to be equal to that total energy.
And that's all this chapter goes over. So it was pretty simple, mostly definitions. Um, but the one example does show how it can be utilized.